Welcome everybody to the second show, uh, Beyond the Bar, Adventures in Law with uh, me, Jeff Rose. Now I have a very humble guest today, so I know he will be upset if I call him the great Larry Posner, but I can tell everybody that Larry wrote the Bible on cross-examination, and I have one of his books beside me, but he tells me that that's only the second edition, so we know that it's there's three editions. Now, Larry has, an ama- has had an amazing career. He was president of the National Association of the 10,000 member uh, criminal defense lawyers in the United States. He was a national legal analyst for NBC, uh, Today's Show, and something I wish I was a, an analyst on, Court to TV, particularly for the Johnny Depp trial. I would have really liked that. And for all you NFL fans out there, Larry was counsel for the Denver Broncos. Uh, I was going to ask him what quarterback there was at that time, but I won't do that uh, just yet. Larry's given more than 400 lectures on trial skills, and he will be in Vancouver uh, giving a CLE course on cross-examination on November 17th. Now, today we have the beauty of Larry enjoying work-life balance. Because you see that Hawaiian shirt he's got on? He is in Kona, Hawaii. And he actually can turn his screen around and show us the waves, but I asked him not to, to do that today. Now, I want to warm up the audience, if I can. Larry, welcome, first of all. Thank you very Thanks, much Jeff. for joining me. It, it is a, I hate to say it because uh, you hear it all the time, but it's a, big, it's a big deal for me and a big deal for our viewers. Tell me something. You seem to have an affinity for Can- Canadians. W- where does that come from? Because you're so much nicer than Americans. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, that answers that, right? Huh? Um, at 13 years old, you knew that you were going to be a criminal lawyer. Now, I was thinking, at 13 years old, all I cared about was how much money I was going to get for my bar mitzvah. Okay? But you knew you were going to be a criminal lawyer. How did that happen? Just, it just it seemed like the right thing. It seemed like defending people was the right thing to do. And, uh, and it always was the right thing to do. And it made law school very easy. Not easy in terms of classes or grades, because I graduated summa cum barely. Uh, but easy in intellectually, I know why I'm here. I've got to get a law degree because they require a law degree to be a public defender. Yeah. And what is it that, apart from being the right thing to do, what was it about you or your polit- or your philosophy where you wanted to be a public defender? Well, I had a bar mitzvah too at that time. Uh, I think if you grow up in a Jewish household, uh, you're, you're, you know, you're brought up on, on oppression, stories of oppression. In fact, you know, one of the things that has been said is all Jewish holidays are they tried to kill us, we won, let's eat. Uh, <laughs> so I think if you grow up Jewish, you understand oppression uh, and you understand the value of fighting against authority. All right. Okay. Um, how did you come to be the master of cross-examination? What was it about cross that made you so interested that you ended up writing probably the most best-selling book on cross-examination? Well, you know, I don't, I think there are a great, an enormous number of lawyers who are, are wonderful at cross. All I did that was different was write down what I was seeing. I said, I'm seeing genius in what other people are doing. How did it work? Why did they do that? How does the technique play out? And I just decided to write it all down. Um, But, you know, as a public defender, you begin, you graduate law school, you, you take the bar, as we say in America. I know you say called to the bar and then you go to work and they hand you a bunch of files. They're human beings and you don't have the vaguest idea how to represent them. 
And as a criminal defense lawyer, reasonable doubt is where you're, you're going. That's your goal. And reasonable doubt is easier to prove through cross than calling witnesses. And so as a criminal defense lawyer, you got to learn how to cross to survive. And learning is the next thing that I was going to ask you about, Larry, because I know in your view, cross-examination is a science to be learned, not an art form. Right. Can everybody learn? Can all lawyers learn cross? No, but the ones who can't learn cross are the ones who have decided they're never going to court. Half of the people with whom we graduated are unwilling to enter a courtroom, to take a discovery, to do a contested hearing. Half of the profession doesn't want anything to do with standing up and talking. So take those out of the equation. What we have left are people who are willing to talk. And remember, talking is still the, the greatest fear of, of most people. So they're willing to engage in public speaking. They're able to read large quantities of material and they're able to apply abstract reasoning. Those are the, the tools we need to be great cross-examiners. Everything else is simply seeing the lesson and learning it. You know, if we, if we try to learn it on our own, we can eventually get there, but it just takes a lot of time and a lot of agony, a lot of pain. It's easier if somebody writes it down and says, here's a technique, here's how impeachment by inconsistent uh, uh, statement works. And once you see how to do it, you don't need years of experience. You can do it next Monday. The interesting, speaking of impeachment, impeaching your witness, I had thought before I uh, perused your book that the goal of cross-examination, the main sole goal was impeaching your witness but you've kind of turned that on its head and and cross-examination for you has become part of proving your own case as the priority can you talk a little bit about that because i always thought it was aggressively impeaching the witness yeah and that's what they've taught us that's where the profession has been for you know certainly our lifetimes and and i think it's wrong the witness is on the stand. I would have been happy if they had never shown up, but now they're here. And as long as they're here, I need to use them for my purposes. Because if, if I don't use them for my purposes, I've hemmed myself in to having to call witnesses and to call my client. And in criminal defense work, you really don't want to call your client. And I think in general, having done commercial litigation, civil litigation, I don't want to rest on my client. I want to get the opponent's witness to admit facts that help me. And so this has evolved into what I call constructive cross-examination, which is really simply saying, witness, you've told a bunch of things and there's some I disagree with and we're going to deal with them, but there's some things you've left out or there's some things you covered very briefly that helped me. Let's go deeper into facts that you will admit. And the benefit of this is that if I get an opponent's witness to admit a fact, I've won that fact. I don't have to try to win it on a credibility argument in closing because the jury or the judge says, this witness wouldn't have agreed with that lawyer if it weren't true. So you see, we even get more power proving the identical fact through their witness versus proving it through our witness. Okay. Um, there are three rules of cross-examination, I understand, that you've talked about. One is leading questions only. Two is one new fact per question. And the third one, I believe, is a logical progression to one specific goal. Does that summarize it? It, it, it does. I, I, you know, I would go back now. I wrote that a long time ago, and it was cute to say three rules. I would go back and change the first one of leading questions only and admit there are those instances where we don't lead. 
but not simply by and large, but but overwhelmingly, we should be using leading questions to teach, to control the narrative, to hem in the witness we are cross-examining. And then, then we keep the questions short so that they can be understood. And so the certainty is what the witness is agreeing to and not agreeing to. And then the hard work is putting things together factually for a judge uh, so that they don't have to accumulate their notes so that their notes reflect what we've proven in nice little packages in chunks. Speaking of um, leading questions, in your book, there's a sub chapter subsection that's called what happens when the enemy words are used. And I'm just going to read a little bit from it because I want you to comment on it. Okay, I know you wrote this quite a while back. In a large, well-publicized federal drug money laundering case, an excellent cross-examiner cross-examined one of the government's major witnesses as to his prior inconsistent statements. The examination of the prior inconsistent statements lasted for more than 90 minutes. During that hour and half cross, the witness was asked solely leading questions to which the verifiable answer was yes. The jury was completely repulsed by the witness's testimony. At the end of this solid workmanlike cross, cross, the experienced trial lawyer asked, can you explain to this jury why, after taking an oath, after swearing to God to tell the truth, you lied repeatedly? I'm not going to finish reading this because I want you to finish it, Larry. Well, he got clobbered. He got hit with the cream pie. You know, with, there's a variety of answers we hear. Why did I lie? Your client threatened the life of my family. Uh, you know, why did I lie? Because I feared what you were going to do to me. There, if you ask why, the world is open to the witness. We don't need it. We've already proved they did lie. You know, the why did you do this is is just it violates all of the rules. It says to the witness, take over my courtroom and then they say whatever they want. And now we're trying to cope with it, which reminds me of something else you said in your book. Never follow a brilliant inspiration in the middle of a trial. Yeah, yeah. It, whenever you're standing at a podium and you've spent days, weeks, months uh, preparing for this, and a thought occurs to you, and you say, I wonder why I never saw this theory before. It's brilliant. The reason you never saw it before is it's a mirage. If, if it were the right theory, you'd have figured it out a long time ago. Trial is, is the presentation of the preparation, largely. Um, I've had a, a, a lawyer say to me, but aren't we taking the spontaneity out of trial work? And I told her, unfortunately, no, there will still be enough spontaneity to go around, but spontaneity in trial is way overrated. What we really want to do is produce our best evidence. We want to be under control. And so if something occurs to me at a podium, and I think I've never thought of this before, now isn't the time to try it out. You gotta, you gotta, gotta think what you prepared is the best path to victory. All right, we're gonna, I'm gonna make you feel a little bit humble again, uh, my friend. You know, I phoned, I was so excited that I was going to interview you. I phoned up two of my criminal lawyers. Yeah, what kind of life do you have? Uh, this is not a highlight film. <laughs> Okay. Remember, I'm it. Listen, you know, this reminds me of two weeks ago. I'm the interviewer. You don't get to ask the questions. <laughs> I got to tell you. you know, so just, I phoned up two of my criminal lawyer. lawyer friends, and I was so excited. I said, I am interviewing the great Larry Posner. And they said, I know Larry. They said, I use the chapter method. And so could you summarize to everybody what the chapter method is? Sure. We're reading discovery, all of us, 
We're making notes, all of us, and we're going to court uh, to ask a series of questions. Those things are given. All the chapter method does is it says, let's organize it. Let's organize the material into short stories. And by short stories, I mean one minute, two minute stories. Take anything that happens and it happens in, in little segments, in little time bites. Let's take the best of those time bites and, and make them into stories for the jury, not what happened next, because what happened next will take us into stories we don't want to talk about. So you take whatever it is you're trying to teach, and that's what we're really doing in trial. We're teaching. And you break it into a little cluster of facts that make a story, and a story has a takeaway. What do I want the judge to understand? And it can be a, a couple different forms. What do I want the judge to know? What do I want the judge to infer? Those are the two things we do. And we put the facts together so that at the end of that group of questions, we hopefully have the judge knowing a thing or feeling a thing. But we don't, we don't look for the last question of a group to sum it up. The last question is simply the last question. It's, I'm done with this little story. I'm moving to another story. And so the chapter method is a way of breaking down information to teach it in a way that is memorable and critically so that a judge or a jury understands what we're doing so they can immediately recognize i see that how that helps your theory or i see how it hurts their theory that's all there is in trial help theory and hurt theory speaking of stories one of the lawyers i phoned mr tesmer from Kelowna, he said he's an adherent of your method he says canadian and u.s lawyers a differ in their approach to the trier of fact. Canadian lawyers tend to be pedantic and USA lawyers in their pitch to juries are better at storytelling. What can you tell everybody today, Larry, about storytelling? Storytelling is, is the natural way the mind organizes information. Uh, the mind does not like to memorize for later use. In fact, the mind is built to discard information immediately if it cannot figure how to apply it. And so the mind is looking to gather information into chunks. And a story is, is a, really a group of chunks. Let me give you an example I use in the lecture. Take a look at the three little pigs. If it did not matter what order you proved your facts, you ought to be able to take all the pages of the three little pigs, rip the binding off, ruffle the pages, and, and read them in no particular order. Try that with your child and see how well it goes. What we want to do is look at the three little pigs and say, notice how we told all of the story of a pig who built a house out of straw and we destroyed that house before we moved to a pig who built a house out of sticks and we destroyed that house before we got to a house out of bricks that's the reason that works with a child is the reason it works with the human mind the mind is seeking organization of facts into comprehensible material the mind thinks about stories and so we organize trial as a series of stories because because bottom line you cannot convince people with information they don't understand the default of the mind is not that person is bright so they must be right it is i get it i get it is the key thing so you know when we talk in stories it's very pleasing to the listener they can follow us the other lawyer um my colleague I spoke to, Mr. Bolton at QC, who's a life bencher amongst many other things, who said to me, Posner's method for cross prep and execution is a first rate instruction manual, but the script must be applied flexibly, flexibly because events and trials are unpredictable. Is the chapter method, Mr. Bolton asks, useful for every cross? Yes. The chapter method is the baseline 
of what we're going to present, then the strange things happen and we cope with them. But the chapter method says, let us limit the number of strange things we have to cope with. When we, and there's something going on scientifically here that's, that's very interesting. The mind processes information using neural resources. And the more neural resources we can throw at a problem, the quicker we can solve it. Anxiety burns through neural resources. It makes the brain think slower. Truly what's happening is cortisol is coating the brain when we're anxious and it's slowing down our thinking. If we do a bunch of the prep work, if we go into trial with script, with chapters, we freed up our neural resources so that when the unusual happens, we literally have more brain available to consider our options. But if we're standing at a podium trying to figure out what should I cross on now? How, what are my facts that I need for this cross? Where am I going next? We're using up so much of our brain on what to do next that we're not good at our trial judgment. So it really is a blend of both. But what we're trying to do is, is leave room in our mind to use trial judgment where we need to. But on the things we can prepare, let's take them into court and feel so much more comfortable as we're cross-examining. Okay. You know, Larry, I've never had uh, problems uh, with follow-up questions, but I don't know if I can do a follow-up question about cortisol and uh, neuroscience and uh, <laughs> things like that. So you've stopped me in, our, in my tracks. You know, another interesting thing in your book that I found was the, how do you, was linking the opening statement to your cross-examination. And I wasn't sure how to do that because I, I usually don't know what's going to come out across. There's surprises. There are some surprises, but what's going to come out uh, in direct by an opponent's witness is the story. You know the story. The story got you into a courtroom. You know, the story in, in broad outline, we know the witness isn't full of surprises. The witness has some surprises, but mostly they're on the script. And, and so we can anticipate what they're going to say. And if we have discoveries, if we have police reports, if we have medical records if we have uh the police notes of the auto accident you know we know what the, the stories are going to be so we prepare that material and we get up with a game plan and the the opening statement is a game plan and the opening statement says we know the crosses the key crosses we're going to do the opening statement gets them ready for those crosses. It highlights for the jury the best information we have. So our opening is about things. It's not about predictions of I think things are going to happen. If there's an inconsistent statement, it's inconsistent. And we tell them about the inconsistency. If the witness admits that they did a thing or didn't see a light or didn't, or they were hurrying because they were late for dinner, or it's snowing so much they should have snow, slowed down, then we talk to the jury about those things in opening. In other words, an opening is designed after a cross is written. An opening gets the jury ready for the stories we love, the stories we can depend on. And then a judge or a jury sees it coming. Now, look what happens. If we build the cross of a witness and they've been they they've got motivations to lie or they've uh, they have fabricated something about their medical history or whatever it is and we know we're going to cross on it if we open on it look what it does now the witness gets called by our opponent and before they even get their butt in a witness chair the judge or the jury is saying, oh, I know about you. I know about how many times you changed your story. I know about the rehabilitation uh, meetings that you skipped. I know in family law, I know that you were supposed to have eight visits on Wednesday night with your kids and you missed three of them. 
and you missed one of them because you had a softball game. I know about you. So we have changed the credibility of a witness called by an opponent before we've ever asked the first question. That's the value of opening. Larry Posner, you're full of nuggets and lessons learned. And <laughs> for the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, you shared some nuggets of wisdom in a column called Lessons Learned. Now, that was some time ago. But I want to give you a few of those nuggets because I like them. And maybe you could say uh, a word or two about them to our, our audience today. Saying I strongly object marks you as an amateur. Saying that would be a reversible error marks you as a threatening amateur. Yeah. I, when I was, I learned so much doing everything wrong first. I, so I said as a public defender to a judge, I strongly object. And he looked at me, he says, okay, I strongly overrule you. I mean, what, what did the word do for me? And then uh, another judge said to me once, as I was fighting with him about a ruling, he says, no, 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 you misunderstand. My rulings are not debatable. They're only appealable. And, and so I realized, stop with this nonsense. And, and also it helped me with something else. My crosses are extremely aggressive in form. I'm not saying in voice, I'm saying in form. They are ordinarily painful experiences. I don't need fights with the judge. I don't need extra drama. I need to live within the judge's rules. I can't afford uh, an objection to my tone of voice or my mannerisms. I've got to always show respect for the judge and the legal system so the judge lets me do what I need to do. And then you said, your reputation for integrity will win you more motions than case law. Yeah, yeah. Every time we do a cheap shot, it's a scar on us forever. They're never worth it. We're playing with our reps. Um, sometimes we screw something up. Sometimes we're late on discovery. Sometimes we did something wrong. And the best way to deal with it is to call yourself on it. Say, here's, I screwed this up, Your Honor. They should have gotten this. They should have gotten it long ago. Whatever it is, we, for instance, sometimes we have a witness that weakens so much that they will say yes to anything. But the problem is you don't want to ask them something that isn't true, even if you could get them to say yes, because you're asking them to say something that isn't true. We, we always guard our reputations because we're going to trade on our reputation through the rest of our lives. You know, almost every day I get a phone call with this dealing with the final nugget I'm going to talk about. And the question always is, how do I handle this? What do I do about it? The nugget was, there will be an opponent you truly despise. Don't let that affect your tactics or ethics. Yeah. We're not fighting trial work is not a contest it, they try to make it us versus them and the best lawyer wins that's not true it's a burden of proof issue it's a teaching environment ignore them there's not much you can do about them leave them alone don't fight with them deal with the evidence ignore them and when we stoop to their level we make mistakes you know they did it too is not a winning thing the winning argument to the court is they did something wrong, but I didn't. That's where we want to be. Not, yeah, they did it, so I did it. I want to talk about a case that um, amazed me for years and years and years, uh, Larry, and you were very involved in it. And I think uh, I, uh, many of the people in the audience today will know about this case. Uh, John Benet Ramsey was a six-year-old beauty queen pageant uh, from your state of Colorado. Yeah. She was found uh, strangled to death in 1996 in her basement, wrapped in her favorite white blanket. 
you were the NBC Nightly News legal analyst for Jean Bonnet. A number of people have been arrested over the years. Her parents were persons of interest, her brother. Uh, her father, John, was president of a computer company, and Patsy, the mother, was a former beauty queen. It was a ransom letter, as you know and recall, and that ransom letter was found demanding the same amount of money that the father had just received in a bonus, $118,000. And that ransom letter included a sentence, you are not the only fat cat around, so don't think that killing will be difficult. Uh, Larry, there's been arrests, there's been persons of interest, there's been a ransom note, and almost 26 years later, the killer remains free. What happened? Well, I did, I did legal commentary for a variety of news outlets <clears throat> on John Bonet. Um, anytime somebody was arrested, they were arrested wrongly. They, you know, there was a guy that even confessed to it. It was ridiculous. Uh, the, there's nobody in the family that's ever been arrested. Nobody's ever been charged. The district attorney declined to indict. Um, if you commit a crime, there's a hundred things you will leave behind. If you're brilliant, you can think of some of them. There was never evidence that really tied a Ramsey family member to the crime. There's suspicions, but there was never hard scientific evidence. There was nothing in the background of the family and the child that indicated the child had ever been mistreated. And we've got to remember, John Bonet was a child that was around a lot of other adults. She had an enormous support system. She never complained of anything. There was never a sign that anybody had ever abused her. It just didn't fit. They never could find the evidence. And what fragmentary evidence they could find um, were some partial DNAs that don't fit the family. They, they handwriting analysis, many judges in the United States have rejected handwriting analysis. It says it's not a science. It's just people looking at it and saying the way they make their K is the way this is in the letter. But they took it to the, to the best, the government took it to the best analysts they could find, and they couldn't say that's a Ramsey that wrote it. In the end, you would think if a Ramsey family member did this, we would have evidence of it, and there isn't any. Now, it's not solved. It's bizarre. It's bizarre to the nth degree, but it gets off on a horrible start because the Boulder Police Department is a, is a metropolitan police department uh, that deals with marijuana at the time. And, you know, it, it, it deals with drunken kids from college. It didn't have homicide investigations. So they botched the initial investigation. You know, they don't find the body. Has it, uh, is it a cold case now? Oh yeah, absolutely. It's sitting there waiting for uh, a DNA match. But here's the thing that's hard for people to, to embrace. The lawyers on this can embrace it. It may be that the cops know who did this, and they also know they can't prove it. That could be. What we always hoped for was that there would be a sex offender arrested somewhere, and their DNA profile would match DNA at the crime scene, and that hasn't apparently happened. So we're not going to get this case solved. Okay. Um, I told you uh, when we uh, spoke last week that I'd have some rapid fire questions uh, for you. Uh, you won't be humiliated or embarrassed in any way, Mr. Posner. I, uh, I uh, uh, promise you, okay? And don't think you're on the witness stand and you just have to answer yes or no. Uh, they're not leading. Uh, some of them won't be leading questions, okay? Now, I'm going to ask you the question, and then I'm going to tell a little story. Gazpacho or guacamole? <laughs> Gazpacho. Gazpacho. <laughs> if any of you want to, to know, uh, Larry wrote a piece in the Denver Post, God knows for what reason, on how to make gazpacho. 
and the whole thing is about tomatoes. So if you want to learn about gazpacho and tomatoes, go back and read Larry's column on, uh, on uh, how to make uh, gazpacho. Well, how not to make gazpacho, really. <laughs> I won't even talk about your wife's reaction to your gazpacho, okay? Well, just to ignore it. But, you know, it was, okay. It was, it was just poking fun at myself. Okay. Yoga or the gym? the gym but even that's distant okay a smoothie or ice cream ice cream ice cream what kind peppermint <laughs> what's your favorite kind of restaurant to go to mm, italian italian now i know you bike ride I do. every day okay. around kona yes is that what you do to chill out or are there other things no, that's what I do. That's what you do. I, hey, wait, I live in Hawaii. I live chilled out. You know, this is every day in Hawaii is the same. That's why we love it. Every day is nice. Every day is happy. Every day the ocean makes pretty sounds. How do you not chill out? Okay. You know, the next, the next um, question, I want to say something first because of what you said about trials. You said you found trials from time to time, not a lot of fun. Yeah. That the tents, the hours are terrible and it's not particularly healthy. Yeah. You said the most of justice happens without trials. Yeah. So what would you say to lawyers, both young and old, Larry, who, who find litigation stressful? And I ask you that in the context of the chilling out question. Well, it is stressful. <laughs> It's always stressful. We can manage the stress. That's the best we can do. In fact, one of the whole, the reasons for the book, for the chapter method, is to say, let me, let me get as much stress out of this as I can. Let me make it easier. And it's just easier for me to go to trial with a script than for me to go to trial without a script. And I got to tell you, when I'm in trial and I need to impeach, I need to know what page and line I'm looking for. 10 seconds of saying I can find it here somewhere would drive me crazy. So, you know, we can manage it, but I can't kid you. I can't tell you. I don't think of trials as fun. I think of the war stories afterwards as fun. Trials hard work. That's what I was going to ask you. Uh, what's the first thing you do after you've finished a long trial? The very first thing you do. Well, we, we do some things in trial to manage. One of the things we do in trial, and we also do it in the final week of trial prep. You remember, these are times before COVID when we were all in an office. We cater dinner. We spend a lot of nice money on, on bringing in a hot dinner so the entire trial team can sit around a table and eat something good and talk about what happened in trial that day and plan our strategy. So we're trying to, to manage our bodies and our minds uh, when, throughout the trial. And when that trial is done, no matter what hour of the day, you know, we think of trials as ending at five. Some juries come back at, at 11. We go to a very nice restaurant win or lose and we sit down together and we socialize but we just got to offload a lot of the anxiety in fact we lost a case once and we were at a very nice steakhouse and the winning team came in and they're celebrating as they and they look around and they think what is wrong with this we've come to this great restaurant to celebrate a victory and the the losing team is already here and they're smiling you gotta smile you gotta get back to regular life <laughs> we, my, my last question for you because you you're is, is you're inspiring what inspires you now oh it's always been teaching teaching's more fun teaching the number of cases I can handle is X. The number of lawyers I can help is 100X. You know, teaching is a much more gratifying thing. Now, I have to say, I think I'm better at teaching because I am a trial lawyer. It's not like theory. The, the things that go wrong, go wrong to me. You know, the surprises that happen, the, the, the witnesses who fight back, the only reason I can talk about them 
is because that's my life too. But teaching is very gratifying. Okay. Um, do we have any questions uh, from the audience uh, here? Well, we don't have any questions. Uh, well, let me let from me mention audience. something to you, Jeff. Okay. When I represented the Denver Broncos, uh, the owner of the Denver Broncos uh, was Pat Bullen. He he was a Canadian. A Canadian owned the Denver Broncos. And a fact that almost nobody knows, Pat Bullen had a law degree. He articled for one year uh, in Toronto and told horrible stories of how he really didn't like being a lawyer. And that was it. He left it behind. Who was the quarterback? Uh, during my years? I don't know. I don't know. John Elway was one of my witnesses, but he was long past being our quarterback. They didn't hire me for my knowledge of sports. I can, I can assure you of that. So uh, Larry will be back, as I said, on uh, November 17th for a whole day about the chapter method and cross-examination. And uh, that's put on by CLE. Uh, Larry, I, I really want to thank you for doing this uh, with us today. It's uh, and particularly being on the the uh, on our show when it's just uh, begun. There's been a, a great number of people who have watched, and I really appreciate it. I there is a comment, not a question. Uh, we're gonna boost this guy's ego again. I don't know if I'm gonna we don't read it. it. Okay. <laughs> well, don't worry, I'm my biggest detractor. Okay. I, you know, I, I've worked with myself for years and I have come away unimpressed. All right. Well, thank uh, to the uh, viewer for asking this. It's not a question, they say, uh, just a comment. I read your book years ago, and I must say it is by far the best legal text I've ever read. It improved my cross so much that at my very next discovery, opposing counsel complimented me. Yeah. I like that. I like using discoveries to win cases. I don't want the trial. The trial means truly, I didn't get what my client needed without the trial. And I think, I think well-scripted discoveries uh, aid us in getting cases resolved without trials. Right. And then if we're in trial, those transcripts are priceless. This will be my last question, and it arises from the viewer's comment. Opposing counsel complimented me. You've talked about in some of your articles about relationships with opposing counsel and complimenting them when necessary, as well as at points constructively criticizing them. And it, for you, is that the nature of a high professional relationship? Yeah, I'd like it to be, but I got to tell you, I've had cases where the two sides had to designate one lawyer on their team who would remain civil to talk to the other lawyer because the fighting was so vicious. We've had these cases where you couldn't agree on what time to break for lunch, and it's just extra stress. It is much easier to deal with a pro who knows what the fights are and who knows where you know, somebody says, you know, I really I think you, know, you owe me this discovery. I, well, you know, I'm not sure about it, but let me get it. And, uh, or somebody walks in the morning of a discovery and says, I found this, you should have had it a long time ago, but let me give it to you now. And my attitude is great, thanks, all right. We're, you know, we're over the hump. I'd like to save the advocacy for when I need it. I really don't need constant fights with opposing counsel. But some, sometimes people misunderstand aggressive litigation to mean being uh, an SOB, and that's just not true. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Mr. Posner, I am, have a great day in Hawaii. Have a great <laughs> bike ride in Kona. Uh, we look forward to seeing you uh, in November. I hope I get to spend some personal uh, uh, time with you. Um, I... Uh, invite everybody back in uh, two weeks for the uh, next show we will have a uh, a young lawyer talking about how uh, she loves to practice law and how she handles uh, practicing law in a big uh, uh, firm environment there is a question on there uh, but and i'm going to say what the question is but i know that it's you and i talked about it before but it's not one we're going to answer uh, today but i'm going to say it anyways any comment on the depth versus heard trial verdict.
uh, things that that get on TV get distorted. The lawyers play to TV, the witnesses play to TV. There's nothing good about televising trials. Okay. Uh, I never I never wanted a camera in my courtroom. It All distorts right. people. We'll leave it on that note. Mr. Posner. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you, Larry. I really look forward to being back uh, in British Columbia. Okay. And thank uh, all the viewers uh, today for, uh, for watching and have a, a great day the rest of the day. Thank you.